Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Jack Canfield Podcast. And today we're diving into a topic that's close to my heart, something called the art of happy money with my good friend, Ken Honda. Now, first, I'd like to give you a little background on Ken. Ken's a best-selling self-development author in Japan with book sales surpassing over 8 million copies since 2001. His latest book is called Happy Money, The Japanese Art of Making Peace with Your Money. It's a new book coming out soon. And Ken has been a business consultant, a successful investor. He's a finance expertise, which comes from owning and managing several businesses, including an accounting company, a management consulting firm, and a venture capital corporation. But Ken's expertise goes way beyond just money and finance. His knowledge and writings bridge the topics of finance and self-help, focusing on creating and generating personal wealth and happiness through developing deeper self-awareness and self-honesty. In his mentoring programs, business seminars, and correspondence courses have been called therapeutic. I've actually witnessed Ken working with people. It's amazing what he does. Take advantage of him in the future if you can. Now, Ken also is the First person from Japan to be voted into the Transformational Leadership Council, which is a group I started of professional and personal development leaders about 20 years ago. Includes people like John Gray, Men from Mars, Lisa Nichols from The Secret, Mary Morrissey from the Brave Thinking Institute, Marcy Shimoff, Dave Asprey, Eric Edmeads, Joe Vitale, Vishen Lakiani from Mind Valley. So good company. Now, Ken is fluent in Japanese, English, and Spanish, and currently resides in Tokyo. Japan. And as you'll soon experience, Ken's a pioneer in marrying the concepts of money and happiness in ways that transform lives. And today, we're going to explore how your emotions and beliefs about money shape your financial reality and how shifting these can lead to not just financial peace and prosperity, but the lifelong happiness that most of us are pursuing. We're all about actionable action here and advice. So get ready to learn how to heal your relationships with money, tackle financial stress, and infuse more joy into all your financial transactions. Ken, it's always a pleasure to have you and have these conversations with you, so welcome. Thank you so much, Jack. Uh, This has been my dream, so I feel my dream come true. I just pulled up uh, your Japanese version of success principles here, you know, and and I, wow, yes, it's been many years since I um, picked it up. It's almost like 20 years, right? So um, I'm so excited that, I'm on your show. Well, I'm excited to have you here. I, I value our friendship. I value what you teach, your counseling. Uh, you invited me over to Tokyo a number of years ago. We got to go to Buddhist temples and Shinto temples. And we uh, did, uh, where did we go? We went to sumo wrestling. We went to one of the greatest sushi restaurants <laughs> I've right. ever been in my life. You are the uh, consummate, uh-huh. you're the, what's the, one the consummate host. So I appreciate uh-huh. you and the generosity. I know Thank generosity you. is a big part of your life. And we'll talk about that. But let's start by talking about your book, Happy Money, which has transformed how mm-hmm. many of us talk about our finances. Can you share the core philosophy behind Happy Money and how it came into being? I was born into a successful tax accountant father. Uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mom. And it was a very unique family because my father started teaching about money since I was five or six. He's, he used to teach me about a, a small business and big business and uh, one day, he wanted me to succeed, um, t- take over his uh, uh, accounting firm and all the other things. So he started teaching me about money. As I grew up, I, I witnessed um, a lot of my father's clients go up and down in business and also with money and life. So I have um, learned like a mini version of what you wrote in your book, Success Principles. So uh, by the time I was 20, I knew I thought I knew pretty much about money and work. So I started my own company and I was successful enough to retire at the age 29 for my baby girl, whom you met at the uh, Transformation Leadership Council. So uh, I retired for four years. And during this uh, four years semi-retirement, I came up with uh, this vision of writing a book. Writing a book was sort of in my dream, but I was a a law and accounting major. So like I was far from writing. I love books. So one day I sat down, I started writing, and then uh, a lot started to come up. And I wanted to write about happiness and money. That eventually became this book, uh, Happy Money in English. 
let's talk about what's the core concept. In other words, normally I don't think about money mm -hmm. being happy or happy money. And you share mm -hmm. some really, I think, radical breakthrough ideas. What, 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 share some of those with us right now. You know, I realize, and also I taught, I've been taught by my great mentors, and uh, my mentor said there are two kinds of money, happy money and unhappy money. You will know it because when you receive it, happy money opens up your heart and because it comes with gratitude. For example, uh, your best clients usually appreciate you the most, and then uh, they give you the, the, the most money. So like, you feel so appreciated because out of, say, 20,000 other coaches, he or she picked me. Wow, thank you. And that is happy money. And also, when you pay bills, you feel out of uh, uh, appreciation, not obligation. You pay uh, at the re at the restaurant cashier, wow, your meal is amazing, you know, thank you so much. Or you buy something at the shopping mall and to say, thank you. And also, my uh, mentor uh, was so happy to pay even taxes when he had to pay millions of dollars. And because he knew his tax dollars are going, were going to contribute uh, building uh, hospitals and schools and help other uh, people in need. So, uh, whatever you do, you do it out of appreciation. That is happy money. And on the other hand, unfortunately, 95% of us are in the flow of unhappy money, which makes us feel small and also uh, makes us feel irritated when we pay bills and also when we pay for things. So uh, happy money makes you open up and grow. Unhappy money makes you small and contained. That's the difference. So it, it's, a, it's an attitude that you have in terms of both giving and receiving? Yes, exactly. So it doesn't really matter how much money you have or how much money you make. Even though you, you could be a billionaire, I'm sure, Jack, you're uh, among your you know great successful friends or uh, clients, there could be people who are always appreciative. And there are those who are very unhappy because they're not satisfied with what they got. So I think as a person, people with happy money, with uh, less money, could be much, much happier than the billionaires who have billions of dollars, but not exactly happy with what they have. You mentioned your mentor. Uh, I've heard you talk mm -hmm. about him several times. You've even written a book about him, co authored a book about him. Uh, tell us a little about him and uh, his philosophy of arigato. Could you do that? So Wahe Takeda was my mentor. He passed away a few years ago. He used to be called Warren Buffett of Japan. He was one of the most successful individual investor uh, in, in Japan. And he was once a ma major shareholder of more than 100 public companies in Japan. There are only 3,000 um, mm -hmm. public companies in Japan, so he owns a, a, so like a bit of Japan. And uh, he uh, loved uh, teaching young people. So one day I was in a long line having like a 10 second private time with uh, Wahe Takeda. What would you ask Warren Buffett if you have 10 seconds? So I thought for many hours and came up with this uh, question. Uh, Mr. Wahe, what is the secret of money? I thought it's a good question. And he said, arigato your money. That means thank your money. And then I got pushed out of the long line. And I, I never had a chance <laughs> to ask him about what is it, what is arigato your money? But I, I was so lucky to be invited back because he kind of uh, liked um, my attitude. So I had like this time, three hours uh, with his um, private time. So he explained about appreciation is a key, inviting happy money is a key of happy success. Uh, so by doing that, you have to find your uh, heart. You have to find your gift. You have to do what you love most and serve people. And as a result, it comes back. It's exactly the teachings that Jack Canfield is, is doing. That's why I'm uh, very attracted to your work. So uh, Wahe uh, focused on uh, thanking money. And also, he was so generous. One time, we were at the restaurant, and then uh, he <clears throat> congratulated the uh, waiting person's smile. You know, we do that all the time. But instead of just uh, compliments, he brought in, uh, he brought up, took up one of his solid gold coin and gave it to her. And she was so surprised because it weighs so heavy. And he said, it's for you, for a good smile. She cries and just walks over. And I ask him the question, you just did a great thing, but you lost about, what, $1,000 gold coin for just a smile? And he said, no, 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 I did a shopping. I bought the lifetime of smile. 
uh, you know, he's, she's going to uh, keep smiling uh, more because of the gold coin. That means she's going to smile for the rest of her life. So for me, it's like I, I bought a, her a smile for a lifetime. That's a good bargain, isn't it? It's, and he was laughing. So that's who he was. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, I, I read somewhere that he used to like just be repeating to himself all day long, like a chant, arigato, arigato, which is a thank you in Japanese. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, he started this funny, uh, mysterious thing called arigato marathon. That means you are supposed to say arigato 3,000 times. You can do it uh, like 30 minutes, 40 minutes, if you keep saying arigato, arigato, arigato. It, it can be gracias, gracias, or thank you, thank you, thank you, in your shower, in your walk, in your meditation. So this arigato meditation 3,000 times a day uh, translates into a million arigato in a year. So he says, if you, if you keep wow. repeating this arigato mantra uh, one million times, Miracles happen. Um, so that's also another book I'm going to write in English uh, in the next few years, uh, the, the Miracles of uh, Arigato. I've seen all the interesting miracles, but I'm sh also ha you have, I'm sure you have seen the power of appreciation, and I'm sure you've told about it. And so it's universal. It works. Yeah. Well, the law of attraction says that the highest vibration is appreciation and gratitude and love and joy. And, and so basically when you are doing anything, like repeating that affirmation or that mantra over and over, or focusing on gratitude, doing a gratitude journal, whatever, what happens that brings your vibration up and then more things flow to mm -hmm. you at that vibration. So you, whatever you're grateful for, you attract more of into your life. That's great. You've written a lot of books. You teach all over Japan. I've been with you when you had like a thousand people in the audience and so on. And what are some of the other major concepts that, that support this happy money idea that you are constantly sharing with people that they find so powerful and impactful that they want to come be with you? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm known as a happy money person, you know, uh, in, in English, but I have written, uh, I don't know, I have lost count, but physical books about 200. I think my original work is about 70 or 80. I'm, uh, I'm an, I've am I'm written a few novels uh, that I sold millions of copies. Uh, all of the theme is uh, find who you are. So my uh, all, all my mentors come from Zen background. So knowing who you are, it's almost like the path to enlightenment is also a path to happy financial independence. So financial independence is something I've taught for decades. And in the process of teaching, I rediscovered uh, in order to be financially independent, you have to do what you're good at. In order to find uh, that, you have to find who you are. And the companies are the same. If your companies uh, don't know what you're good at, you're going to fail. But if you know what you're good at, you are, as an individual, as companies, uh, you're going to thrive. So you have to know who you are. You have to know what you're good at. You have to know why you're born to this planet. You are here. We are here to serve. So if we if we find who we are and then find special gifts, not one, usually it comes in three or four. So you have to multiply your gifts. That's my expertise. So finding finding your gifts and multiply them in your own unique uh, blend. So then um, you become one and only, and people will be attracted to you. And you don't have to be so popular. You can only attract, say, two or 3,000 people. And if you can attract 3,000 people, uh, you can make a living. I've shown people how to do it. Like uh, I have one of the largest online salons in, J in Japan. That means a uh, subscription model. Um, we used to have 20,000 people on the community. Now we have about a few thousand. But still, if you have a few thousand people uh, who is uh, happy to um, send you $10, you can make a comfortable uh, income. So do what you love and be surrounded by people who love you, support you. You don't need to have a few thousand people. Only You need only like 200 people. So if you can find or if you are found by 200 people on this planet, 7 billion people, 8 billion people, you can make a happy living. So do what you love and um, multiply the gifts. That is the basics of my teachings. How do you help someone find out what their gifts are? Yes, there are so many ways I have uh, taught over f three decades. And uh, one thing is that people... Um, 
just ask me, why do you spend so much money on that? For example, I loved going to seminars. You know, I've attended your private seminars and mentorship program. It's because I love it. And I, I'm sure, Jack, I, I, I've seen you uh, privately at Transformation Leadership Council. You're the one who are taking most notes, right? <laughs> and, and those people who love yeah. learning. Who, who, are, who are likely to teach. That's my idea. So whatever you invest your time and money, for me, learning, for some people, cooking, for some people, healing. So whatever you, you focus on spending, you are likely to do that work. So uh, that is, for example, uh, one thing. And then uh, when you have a little time, uh, uh, just observe what you're doing without thinking. You may be internet surfing. You may be just talking about that. I've seen uh, Dr. John Gray just talk to a janitor person in a hotel. I thought uh, she was a close friend of his and because I wanted to talk with him. I waited for like 20 minutes. And then she cried and uh, Dr. Gray hugged her. And I thought uh, uh, her she's like a longtime friend. And I asked Dr. Gray, uh, who was she? And she said, oh, no, no, I just uh, I was taking a walk and just, you know, stumbled across her. And just we had we got into a conversation and and, and you know, probably obviously that she has some issues. So like uh, for Dr. Gray, it's like a daily conversation of helping people. So if you are mm-hmm. if you are able to do what you love to do, you're in heaven and you're likely to be um, surrounded by your best clients. Yeah, I, I read a quote once, um, I forget who it was from, I think it was the guy who invented the light bulb. And he said, when your vocation feels like a vacation, then you know you've made it. And I think that's really true. Now, I've been with John when he's done that. I, we were in Las Vegas for, a, 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 I think it was a book launch thing. And we went to a bar afterwards with the five of us. And he started talking to the bartender, this woman. She turns out she was a single mom. By the time he was finished, he knew her whole life. She <laughs> she was ready to sign up for whatever he would do, you know, uh, because he shows such interest in relationships. <laughs> and that's what he's all about. Uh, it's cool. I imagine you're familiar with this concept of ikigai. I learned about it. Uh, it's a Japanese yes. thing about, like, and, and I find that really fascinating in relation to what you're talking about, the idea of like, find out what you mm-hmm. love and then discover, you know, do, do you do it well? And if you don't, work on improving mm-hmm. it. Is it something that other people need and are they willing to pay for it? If you can answer yes to all those things, then you have your life purpose at some level. So I thought that was really interesting. And this become very popular, that whole concept of Vicky Guy in the last few years. Yes, exactly. So I'm writing a book on... Ikigai and happy money, because ikigai and happy oh, money just, just uh, almost like twins. So it, uh, it's going to come out good. fairly soon. So uh, the concept of doing what you love and happy money, uh, almost like uh, the two sides of the same coin. So uh, find your ikigai, right. your life purpose, and then happy money fo- follows um, after. So that's another uh, national bestseller I wrote. Do what you love and make sure money follows you. Because oftentimes people do what they love, but they forget about money. So uh, they could be a starving artist at the end. I um, Someone said recently, if you look back at your childhood wh- and look at what did you love to do as a child when there was no, mm-hmm. you know, you didn't have to make money and there weren't all these constrictions on you about meeting other people's needs and expectations that a lot of that will tell you what it is you love to do. And I found for me, I was always the leader when I was a kid. You know, I was the one who set up the mm. baseball game and said, let's go play marbles and, and and do that. And I was always teaching everything I knew to everyone else. And so here I am today still being a teacher. <laughs> Fascinating. Interesting. What did you love to do when you were a kid? I'm curious. Yes. Uh, um, in fact, I was, uh, I gather, um, uh, uh, like, um, you know, neighbor kids. And I, I think I remember I, I loved teaching about the rules of the, uh, you know, baseball. So I, I think I was a teacher then too. And uh, one thing I teach is that what you were scolded most by your parents, because that shows your gift. I was scolded for talking too much. One time on a, from a school, a school card report from my uh, third grade teacher, uh, she said to me, oh, to my to my mom, uh, Ken talks more than I do. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, tell him to shut up during the classes. You know, obviously I was chatting with my friends in the back. So I was scolded so many times, just shut up, you know, don't talk. 
and I ended up talking, and I, I ended up getting paid by speaking. So what you were scolded when you're a child, just remember that's that's yours. That's uh, your gift, definitely. That's I mean, I love it. I love it. I love it. Oh my gosh, I uh, there, there's a famous American comedian named Jay Leno. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He had a talk show at night, mm -hmm. and um, he was in class at school. He was such a cut up. And making just telling jokes all the time that one of his teachers said, look, I'll give you the first 10 minutes of my class. You can do a stand up comedy routine if you'll let me have the last 40 minutes to teach history. <laughs> and so so that's, how, that's what happened. That's how he managed to not get thrown out of school. <laughs> Interesting. That's I, I love about that's why I love about, I love about America. You know, American teachers are so great and resourceful. I, I know you were once a teacher. You know, Japanese teachers just, you know, if, if you do something like that, you'll be just thrown out of the classroom and you're supposed to stand for like two hours or something. So I love about America for being so flexible and being so open. That's great. It's true. Not everyone is, but a lot of people are. You have a course now coming out soon called Happy Money Accelerator. You want to talk about that for a minute? Thank you. So I'm doing a lot of things, but um, I'm teaching uh, one one concept a month. You know, I've been teaching about manifest, goal manifestation uh, a, a lot, which I learned a lot from you. And also I'm learning about um, so many other things. So power of relationships and uh, power of money, money IQ, money EQ, money emotional intelligence and money uh, financial intelligence. You need both. So stuff like that, I teach every month. So I, I already started the course. We have about 1,500 people from all over the world. Wow. I teach in Japanese, so there will be a simultaneous interpreter. But I'll just, um, I, I, I feel so shy about teaching in, in English yet. So when I feel more comfortable, I'll start teaching in English. Well, you're, you're ready, I can tell you. <laughs> your, your English is much better than you think it is. I, very understandable. Um, <laughs> I think my passion so, is ma making it. Yeah, well, it, it works. Let me ask you this. You mentioned money, emotional intelligence. Can you talk about that a little bit? What is that? So I, I have taught uh, this thing called money EQ. A lot of uh, teachers, especially in America and Europe, they focus on money IQ, which is fi uh, financial intelligence, which is super important. Mm -hmm. But I found out that money EQ, emotional intelligence, is as important as money IQ because the most financial savvy people make stupid mistakes emotionally and they end up in jail, they end up losing everything. The head of hedge, fund, uh, hedge funds did too. What? They do what? And then <clears throat> uh, they lose all the money. So unless you're, uh, you have a healthy relationship with money emotionally, you can mess up big. And also, uh, you cannot be happy. So, uh, financial, uh, emotional intelligence is important. So, what so would I, be I, that's what I teach. The, what would be an example of like you mentioned, like a hedge fund manager screws up, or somebody loses their fortune, or makes stupid investments, or whatever? What what's causing that? Like, what's the source of what? What's an example of a bad EQ? Yes, I think a lot of us uh, are drawn to grow our money more. You know, one time I read a, a confession of a corn artist, and he said, uh, there, there, um, there is only one kind of person that I cannot uh, deceive. And he said, the people who are not interested in money. <laughs> and it's so true. You know, corn <laughs> artists cannot, cannot steal your money. <laughs> a, a lot of people want to uh, grow their money. That's why they just invest with this corn artist, right? So uh, uh, we have this great need to do more uh, and get more. When you are emotionally off, you want to uh, do more, eat more, and that's our problem. So uh, our endless, we have this endless hunger or thirst for more money. So uh, we have to know, tell ourselves how much food is enough, how much drink is enough, how much money is enough. Because uh, if you just um, um, make about a million dollars, which is a big money, uh, you are surrounded by all the friends who are making $3 million, and then you need to make more. And if you're surrounded by people who are making $5 million, people are having uh, helicopters or big boats and private jets. And then if you, have, uh, if you make about $100 million, and then you're surrounded by people with big jets. So there is no end. 
So unless you you know how to satisfy yourself, you always feel small. A, f- a friend of mine who has a private jet said he feels so small because whenever he pulls over to this uh, special security terminal, and then all the private jets are huge. His is like a tiny, tiny thing. So uh, even if you are successful and financially well off, there's always somebody better. Uh, I, I one, one time I, I read an um, article, mega jet owner complained about his uh, jet's interior is too standard. All his friends uh, ordered uh, Hermes or Chanel or whatever. <laughs> the seats are so as, as expensive as a jet. So if you just, uh, just keep going up with the uh, uh, expensive uh, stuff, there's no end. So that hunger and th- thirst for money uh, is going to um, disturb your life. You know, it's interesting. One of the concepts I learned early on in this whole human development work was uh, the difference between content and context. And the content mm. is like your jet, the interior design, the money you have in the bank, how many cars are in your garage. That's all content. But the context is the bowl that holds the content. And if the context is not enough, then no matter how much is in that bowl, the context is always not enough. So a million dollars, not enough. Billion dollars, not enough. hundred million, not enough. And so basically most of us that I've worked with in my life feel like they're not enough. And as long as you have that context that I, I am not enough, then this desire to have more to prove that you are enough never works because the context is always not enough. So we have to change the container, which is your belief structure, that holds all this content. And once you do that, then mm-hmm. you don't have that constant thirst for more. You can be satisfied. And that's what we really want. We want to be we want to be happy and satisfied. Yes, exactly. And and Jack, since uh, um, I'm, I'm in this position, may I ask you one question? Sure. I've known you uh, for some years and I know you're a very, very happy person and I highly respect you. Mm-hmm. How can you satisfy mm-hmm. yourself with what you have? Or well, I'm sure you have so, uh, so much and you've achieved so much, but you know you can do more. So uh, as much as you can see that you can do more, how can you satisfy with where you are? I'm, I'm very curious from Zen perspective because you know how to do it. Yeah, I, I have like really gone through a major transition in the last year. Um, I mm-hmm. always, you know, I'm, I'm 79 as we record this and I'll be 80 this summer coming up. And what happens is I always felt like I wanted to do more, make more of a difference. Mm. And I realized recently that part of that was coming from this sense of lack of significance that I needed to do more to prove that I was significant, that I mattered, that I was worthy of taking up space on planet Earth, as one person described it. And I recently had an experience where I was working with some people on the importance of like forgiving the unforgivable. And I, I, I anyway, in that process, who came up in my mind was, was Vladimir Putin. And how could I forgive him for all the damage I think he's done millions of people died and so forth as a result of it and as i began to get a sense of his life and how he's lived i got that he really is driven by that same need to be significant if i can put the soviet union back together and get crimea and ukraine and poland and all these things and reunite them under one banner then i will have done something significant in the world and as soon as i had that realization i remember i just had this image of my door into my office and you go into my office and three feet on either side is just wall-to-wall plaques and diplomas and pictures with presidents of the united states and all these things that was proving that i was significant and i would like literally go off travel for three days to go somewhere and give a free graduation uh, speech at a university and then he gave me an honorary doctorate which proved I was significant, you know? And so I realized I don't need to do that anymore. And what's really true for me now is I'm not driven. I know I, I've, I've done a lot of things. I made a difference. So that satisfied my, but really asking what brings me the greatest joy. I really believe after all the work I've done with the law of attraction, that joy is our feedback system that tells us if we're on track or not. 
And if I'm doing something and I'm resenting it, if I'm doing something and I wish I wasn't, if I wish someone else was doing it or it's too <laughs> late at night, I'd rather be in bed or whatever, then I know that I'm off course. This is not taking me toward the fulfillment of my life purpose. So basically now using joy as my feedback system, if it's not bringing me joy, I'm not doing it. I'll say no. Uh, I'm not here to meet your expectations. I'm here to fulfill my purpose. Mm -hmm. And I know that joy is the essence of that. Like you talk about happy money, to me, happiness and joy mm -hmm. are similar. I think there's a little a bit of a qualitative difference. But for me, it's not about proving I'm enough or doing enough or having enough anymore. I've got plenty. And certainly, you know, Oprah Winfrey has $3 billion. I don't think she's doing it to what she does to get more money. She enjoys what she does. And so she's going to keep doing it because she enjoys it. And that's kind of how I am with my life now. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing because all the viewers watching this are just uh, getting so much out of it. Because I know you don't have to do this with me, but you're doing this out of generosity. And, and also, um, you know, you're impacting a lot of people uh, this way. And, I'm, and I know you are enjoying it, too. So I so appreciate it in so many different ways. Yeah. I, I, you look, you're one of my favorite friends we don't spend a lot of time together but every time we are together i just enjoy the heck out of it and I, I love watching you teach i love watching you interact with your daughter i love watching you have a good time in your life i mean when we were in new orleans last week at a, the, the transformational leadership conference i was going out to a sushi bar to have dinner which was kind of ironic because you're Japanese and you were going out to see uh, the, the, the jazz greats at the, uh, <laughs> whatever, whatever that club was. And you were just having fun with your daughter, you know, and I was having fun with, with who I was with. But the point being that I think it's about enjoying yourself, you know, because if you ask people, and there's a lot of research on this lately, that if you go to the bottom, if you had that, what would that give you? And if you had that, what would that, what would the private jet give you? And now you got a big one with the, their maze interior and so what would that give you ultimately at the bottom line of it it's happiness and i've often mm -hmm. said to people you don't have to spend seventy thousand dollars to feel happy you know they have a you don't have to have a mercedes-benz uh to be I, I remember i was this was early on in my work in human potential and i was doing an exercise in a training where i was a, a you know a student and they were going like well what do you want and i said i want a new car and what would that give you? Well, then I'd feel like I belong. Well, what does that mean? Well, when I stop at my traffic light in the town I'm living in in West LA, Santa Monica, everyone's got a, you know, a Mercedes Benz, an Audi, a BMW. I don't feel quite like I belong. And um, so what do you really want? Well, I want to belong. Well, if you belong, what would you feel? I'd feel happy. So what do you really want? I want to be happy. Do you really need to have a Mercedes Benz to be happy? No, I just saved myself $70,000, you know? So basically <laughs> it's about pursuing the thing that gives you the greatest joy. And if you do that, like it goes back to Ikigai. We see all these people living in, um, you know, the, the island in the south of Japan where I think that all started. And what ha happens is that you got these people that are 105 years old, grandmothers out playing with the kids and people are working all day long, growing their vegetables, having fun, laughing together, dancing together, and they're fulfilled. And they don't have million dollar bank accounts, but they have friends, they have community, they have health, they have joy. Exactly. So thank you for sharing your life. You know, you're just uh, another beautiful <coughs> example. And uh, at the age 80, uh, not people can function as well as you do, you know, uh, physically, and me emotionally, and mentally. Your response is like 10 times faster than I think people in their 80s. So I have so much admiration and I'm, I'm not so happy to, uh, I'm just uh, uh, doing my best to translate your book into Japanese again. So, you know, that way yeah. your um, teaching will just go on and... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm so appreciative of uh, what you have done and who you are. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate what you're continuing to do. And I, I, you know, I move, I lift weights, I eat good food, I laugh a lot, I dance, I sleep, I do the things we're supposed to do. You dance actually and, uh, so yeah. well. <laughs> I do. I do. It's true. It's yes. True. Yes. I was so surprised yeah. at, at the way you dance. <laughs> I enjoyed watching. It's fun. I enjoy it. Oh, good. I appreciate it. Well, we're running out of time here. I just want you to know I love you. I appreciate you. 
thank you for uh, being part of this. You're one of my favorite people on the planet. And uh, anything I didn't ask you that you want to speak to, any final words? We'll put your website and all that up on the, uh, you know. We'll oh, right, right, right. Notes. Yeah. We'll yeah. Well, the last thing, uh, I think a few months after this will be released, my True Wealth, my next book is coming out uh, in North America and the world. So it's about a novel about the grandfather who leaves nine letters uh, for his grandson, but no money. So this boy receives a package of nine letters from his grandfather, and he sets off a journey. So I hope everybody watching this will take a look, uh, because uh, this boy is guided by synchronicity. We there are synchronicities everywhere, but uh, uh, we don't know that we don't know how to read it, how to catch it, how to act on it. So uh, especially young people, I want you to, you to observe what's going on in the world and just pursue your synchronicity. True wealth. Can you give us a clue what one of the letters contains? The first letter is synchronicity. And uh, the, the, the letters that grandfather le left, each letter has a title. The second one is decision. So when he opens up one letter, he gets guided to new things. So, you know, I don't want to spoil the, uh, the fun, but, you know, just uh, um, okay. I think people will start uh, hearing about this, you know, sooner. So uh, I, I hope we'll pick it up. And then that will be the best time for your life. So it's a lot of wisdom contained in a novel with nine letters. I love it. Yeah. All so right, that's somebody friend. like you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you. And give your give my love to your daughter and, um, and your wife. And just keep, carry on. I look forward to uh, being in thank Japan you. with you next time. Okay. Yes. Take very care, soon. Ken. Thank you. All Thank right. you, Jack and everybody. Thanks, thanks to all you who tuned in today for watching. We really appreciate you uh, being part of this and um, hope you took some good notes and make sure you check out Ken's book, Happy Money, and the one coming out soon called True Wealth. Ken literally is like a like an iceberg. You hear things up here, but when you read the book, there's just so much more wealth, of depth of wealth uh, underneath all that. So make sure you uh, take advantage of both of those resources and uh, we'll see you again next time on the Jack Canfield Podcast. Mm -hmm.